Well, uh, very excited to be here uh, with, thank you, Anna, for setting this up uh, with, with Jyoti and her wonderful new book. Um, I'm just gonna go, I'm just gonna uh, plunge straight in um, and maybe, uh, you know, Jyoti just ask you to give a little bit of introduction. Uh, you, you have such a storied, impressive resume, but I think it would be lovely to hear about, um, you know, just the, the, the human behind the bullet points. So we'd love to hear a little bit about you. Um, and then I can tell you about all the things I loved about your amazing new book, uh, Sisters of Mokama, uh, and dive into themes from there. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, as you know, I'm, I'm a journalist. I work for the New York Times. Um, I lead the editorial board at the Times now. Um, but I've been a journalist for many, many years. Um, and this book really sort of came about um, from, you know, sort of the typical questions that you ask as a young person as a teenager of your family you know what is our story like how did we come to the united states you know i, I knew that i mean i was born in india but i didn't remember it i moved when i we moved when i was very small to the united states um, so you know my parents would sort of tell this big story about well you know we came in the early 70s you know your mother had studied nursing at this school run by nuns from Kentucky and she became a nurse and we came here and sort of we lived happily ever after kind of uh, sort of glossing over all the details so you know it was really just sort of as I got older and became a journalist and you know you know I was sort of like asking questions about this kind of thing for a living uh, and after also spending some time in Bihar which you know if, if you've spent any time in that part of India, you know, it's a really, really difficult place. Um, I started to understand how remarkable it was, like how unusual and also just like, why, like how did they end up in this, this sort of remote corner of India, you know, and like why from Kentucky and how did this all happen? So, um, you know, my mother only really had part of the story, like the part that she had experienced, which I think is true for many family stories, you know, um, your parents only, like they only know sort of part of it. So uh, um, the book is really kind of a the process of me, you know, filling in all those blanks of like, how did this happen and why and what was the context? And, you know, as I was finishing it, I, I realized also, I mean, so much of it is also about American history again, and, you know, the history of this order and women in that period, both in the United States and in India. So by the end of it, I, I sort of felt in a way that it was an effort to, um, I think, write myself or my family story into the larger American story also, you know, um, this is this idea that our coming to the United States wasn't just kind of a random coincidence or just like, oh, we thought this would be a great idea. So we ended up here. It was all, you know, it's kind of part of a larger sweep of things that were going on. I think, you know, as individuals, we don't always understand or appreciate how our choices and our actions are actually part of a larger sweep of history. So the book is is my attempt to, to do that. That's amazing. Um, and and this is your story and, and your book, but maybe I'd love to give, uh, you know, sort of this group and maybe recording a little bit of context of me. I was born in mm -hmm. India um, and your book reminded me that I went to a Catholic school um, in Southern India for most of my life. Um, my my journey and perspective, which will influence so many of the questions I'm gonna ask you today. Um, I am an entrepreneur, I'm a, I'm a woman founder. Um, I've worked mostly in high, growth, high growth technology companies um, and most recently started a company called Found, which is telehealth. Um, and it's modernizing weight care, uh, and it's it's in it's in medicine. It's 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 founding, and so so many of the themes through the book uh, that came up were, uh, it, you know, it's incredible. It's it's clearly India and in a time and place, uh, but it's also women, uh, and it's and it's entrepreneurial. There, there were so many stories and have so many examples of uh, right from the book of. Uh, the challenges may be specific in their in in their specific time and place, but they're pretty universal uh, in the context of building something. And so um, uh, that was sort of you know one of the big themes that I was I was really hoping to to explore. I think you touched on this a little bit, so maybe we, we I would love to uh, love to ask about 
uh, when you're telling the story, um, and I love that you're saying, you know, sort of writing yourself into 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 the broader narrative, both you know, connecting both India and America. What was the most surprising or unexpected thing uh, you learned while researching and writing the book? Mm-hmm. Probably the the most surprising thing. I think perhaps you know many of us have. Um, uh, preconceptions about you know a community of religious women right of of nuns and like what they might be like you know they're in their habits and you know you imagine they're always very sort of pious and somber right like even in their their private lives but um I think the most surprising thing for me again because I in the research I uh was able to find you know these sort of collections of letters that some of the nuns had written home to their families over the years. So these were, you know, private letters, obviously, I mean, the family families allowed me to see them. Um, but, you know, they're, they're not like that at all. I mean, really, mm-hmm. I, mean, uh, they're, I mean, they're all different. It's not that they're all the same, but, you know, for them, uh, this mission, going to India, starting this hospital, as difficult as it was, you know, the hardships that they endured, of course, all of that was there. And yes, it was a religious mission, but they were also kind of, this was like the adventure of a lifetime. I mean, they were having a great time. It was like, this is my dream. I want to go abroad. I want to do this. This is, I think also as, as uh, religious women, as nuns, being a missionary is like the hardest thing you can do. It's like the most prestigious, difficult, like, that's the, that's like the most, you know, um, like for, like, I think of journalists, right. It's like being a foreign correspondent mm-hmm. that like, yeah, that's the like the toughest field. thing. The yeah. <laughs> Catholicism. Right. Right. Exactly. And so they were really, you know, they were really into that. And the, you know, the whole idea that during world war II, this order did not have a chance to go overseas. Like that was a big thing, you know? And Mm. these younger women kind of felt like, wait a second, you know, other nurses, other uh, religious women, like they get, they're having that adventure. Like, why can't we, you know? And so that was really a big motivating thing for them. And once they got there also, it's like they would write these really colorful letters and it's like, everything was just kind of a big adventure and they couldn't wait to like tell people back home about it. That's amazing. I have I've so many quotes that I pulled out where I'm like, sometimes I'm like, are we talking about a certain time in India with missionaries? Or are we talking about women building things here? Um, <laughs> uh, I'm going to read a, a line. Um, I think you said the, the women had given themselves to the church, but they knew too that they had been given something in return, a chance to live out a great adventure thousands of miles from home. Um, and so, yeah, the, it's a uh, that's really, really, really interesting to hear. Um, I think it, it makes me, um, we have some fantastic women founders on the call. Thank you, Anna, for calling out. Hi, Marshall. Uh, very nice to see you. Um, uh, just just curious how you think about the, now that you've researched it, the book is out, um, uh, thoughts on some of the universality of, uh, uh, mm-hmm. you know, the one of the themes that you so beautifully bring out is um, even with women, there's these sort of competing um, you know, perspectives, right? There's uh, the competence and resourcefulness of frontier women versus, mm-hmm. you know, useless and decorative women of the cities. And it's, you know, yes, it's a time and a place, but it's such a, um, uh, can, can right? Where, mm-hmm. where is women's place in society? We, mm-hmm. It feels like we've entered some of the questions, but we've just sort of pushed the ball forward a little bit. So would love you, love your thoughts on, uh, I don't know, just, just broader themes and you know, sort yeah. of universal applicability. Today. Yeah, abso- absolutely. So, I, I mean, and I, I love that, you know, you're sort of connecting this to women founders of, of, of companies, because I think that's, you know, like, obviously these nuns wouldn't have called, them, they wouldn't necessarily have <laughs> called themselves entrepreneurs, but like, they definitely had that spirit, you know, like, as, as I think I was telling you, earlier, um, you know, each order of religious women, like they have their traditions, their mottos, their, you know, sort of parts of their history, like their mission statement, you know, if you will, the thing Mm -hmm. that they all sort of like come back to. And for this order, 
you know, they were founded on the frontier, right? So they're they're very kind of conscious that like from their beginning, like they had that that spirit, that idea. And so one of the, um, you know, every order has these kind of sayings of like, you know, things that define them. And one of the things they would say is like, well, what defines us is a willingness to like venture forward even when we don't know the way, right? So it's like very much like that was a thing that they would sort of say over and over like to each other, they would, you know, sort of refer to that idea whenever they encountered something that was difficult. Mm-hmm. And that, um, you know, where they, you know, they weren't sure like, well, how do we do this? You know, like, we had no idea what we were getting into, like, how do we get over this obstacle or deal with like this, you know, oh, we're in this place, like we knew that it would be difficult, but like, oh my gosh, like this local politics is incredibly complicated. We don't really want to get in the middle of it, but we have to deal with these people, you know, how, how to figure that out. Like there were just a million things like that, um, that they're still navigating now, frankly. Um, and that is, you know, that's the spirit that sort of like would, would keep them, go- keep them going. Um, but you know, that uh, those, the quotes that you mentioned about, uh, you know, like what kind of woman they want, mm-hmm. that, like you would be, that was something that was also, I think, very present for them. And again, it's like easy to forget that although these women were nuns and so, you know, they're not like on some level, they don't fit into um, the traditional gender roles of like getting married or having a family or, or things like that. Um, They were, they very much were women, you know, like they, would talk about, I mean, again, sort of stereotypical things like they would worry about their weight and like what they looked like and their outfits and like, how are we gonna iron our clothes when, you know, <laughs> there's, it's so humid and it's raining all the time, things like that. They would, they were conscious of that, about, you know, how they looked, but also, again, it's like they had to, and I think, again, this is something that I'm sure many um, women founders or just women who are in male dominated professions have a sense of it's like, well, if I'm the only woman or if I'm doing something like women have not done before, like, how do I, how am I going to define my role? Like, what does, what does that look like? It was, you know, it's completely up to them to decide. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that was like, it was, it was hard and it was something that they, you know, they had to figure out for themselves because again, it's like, this was an order that had started out with that frontier spirit, but then for, you know, for a couple of decades had very much become, you know, kind of part of the establishment of Louisville and of Kentucky. And it's like, okay, well, how do we break out of that? How can we just stop being the sort of like polite teachers in these nice schools and then do something completely different. Like, what does that look like for us? So, yeah, that was. I, I mean, I, and I'm. I would love to hear uh, how you all like navigate that because, um, again, I know as a journalist, you know, sometimes you think about that, right? Like when I was a foreign correspondent. I mean, uh, you know, I, I became. I was a bureau chief for a Time magazine for several years, and. I like when I got there that, and this was in 2008, there had never been a woman in that position, never been a person of color in that position and never been, there had never been Indian in, in that position. Wow. So it was, I mean, literally people would, you know, I would go make appointments with people and they were, they would like look around like, okay, we're, we're supposed to meet the bureau chief for Time Magazine. Like, who are you? <laughs> so uh, so yeah, it's, um, it's, a, it's that process of you have to define for yourself, like, no, I can be in this role. I can do this, but I'm going, I'm going to be myself or whatever, whatever that means for you. That's, that's amazing. I have so many questions about the, the Bureau Chief, but I'll go back to something that you were saying that it's even the order had become in the story, right? Such a part of Louisville and so much of these pioneering women were, they were sort of uh, taking the ethos of the order, but they were it, it was the frontier spirit and that there's always sort of a, a frontier where you get to, you know, get to be, uh, it, it's, a you know, social structure is a lot more fluid. You get to be dodged, undeterred, right? Um, uh, disobedient, if you will, or, you know, That's well-behaved right. women right. make history, but maybe it's in the frontier, it's, it's more mm-hmm. permissible. 
mm-hmm. and to be less well behaved. Um, and yeah. I think you, you were mentioning that of uh, the original idea of the order, that of the right, the resourceful frontiers woman to survive. And I, it just made me think that one, that actual motto wouldn't be out of place um, at, at a startup and <laughs> anyway, mm-hmm. at, at a startup at all. Um, yeah, that's a very perceptive, perceptive uh, observation because it's true. I mean, that's, you know, almost by definition, a frontier is a place where the existing order hasn't reached yet, right? So it requires people to sort of go out to the edge of whatever that is and kind of figure things out, right? So if you if you are the person who's doing that, then there, are, you know, maybe there aren't a lot of rules. Like maybe it's up to you to make up those rules and whatever group or society or norms you might've come, come from or come with, this is your chance to say like, well, there's no one else here. Like, I'm just kind of, I'm gonna just sort of do my thing. And that was very much, you know, when these women started their mission because it was the first presence of their order outside of the United States. They, I mean, they did that all the time. I mean, they would, um, they would sort of encounter things that were new, like as simple as, you know, just getting around their their compound or in the area, um, they realize like, you know, we have all these people to take care of and we have to get from place to place quickly. There are no, like basically there's no way to get around it other than walking. So they're like, well, we're getting bicycles, you know, and their order had never ridden, like that was, that it just never come up. Like, are we allowed to ride bicycles? It's like, well, we're not going to wait and ask. Like, we're just, we're riding bicycles, you know? So they would do that, you know? I mean, well before Vatican II, they changed their habit to be more like the local clothing, just out of practicality. You know, there were so many things like that where they just, you couldn't wait. You can't wait to ask permission. They would just sort of do what needed to be done and kind of hope that it was okay later. It's um, it's really interesting, right? There's clearly this uh, the freedom and the frontier. You get to shape it the way, um, right? Uh, you you get to you get to, um, uh, you, there's no forgiveness needed because there's no precedent. But th- there's also another interesting trade-off that you that you mentioned in the book around. Um, did they really know the magnitude of the enormity of what lay ahead? Right, you're coming into India right post independence. In a in in you know in a in a place where it's it isn't I mean even even the even the place today is is not something right it's um, you casually sort of stroll into and for an order that hadn't sort of left their confines do they really know the indication of you know sort of the the historical context the violence mm-hmm. or what it caused it and I guess the the broader question is. If they had known that in greater detail, would it have helped it help them or hurt them? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. I don't. I mean, I don't know if it would have helped or hurt them. I mean, definitely, like there wasn't a ton of news about what was going on in Bihar, in particular, or even in India in mm-hmm. general at that time. I mean, obviously, like the actual like political moment of partition was in all the big newspapers, but um, even in India, I mean, it would take days, sometimes weeks, if ever, for the news of some of the, you know, massacres that were happening, particularly in the interior of the country to sort of reach even just like the nearest city, right? So there was was very incomplete information. Um, So I don't, I mean, I don't know if, if they, even if they had that information, like how would they have processed it or, use that you know it's like I think they they knew that like okay there's no other hospital these people like there are people in need like we have skills that can be useful and we it's like there's just something they also just really wanted to do but you know when I think about that that idea of you know these were people at a historic moment who were clearly part of something much bigger, right? Like they, and of course, like all the Indian women, they worked with all the the people at that time. Mm -hmm. They were part of this big historical moment. Um, And in a sense, like they, you know, they were building an institute, like one of this, 
I mean, an institution that still survives, like an institution of independent India, there were so few hospitals, so few nursing schools, and they, they built that. Um, but of course they didn't realize how significant what they were doing was. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when I reflect on that, I, I sort of feel that, you know, many of us are, I mean, even now, right? Like we've all lived through the pandemic. We're, we're all sort of part of different historical moments. And we don't, if you can't know in your own life, mm -hmm. how significant it is, the thing that you're doing, you know, mm -hmm. it's, you really can't. I mean, I think of really, and it's not just these women who did something so dramatic, right? Like going thousands of miles away. I mean, almost every Indian at that time, people who went from their villages to cities, people who crossed the borders, people like my parents who went from South India to North India, which was like another country at that time. Mm -hmm. I mean, those were, you know, now we've realized that those were really significant historical movements of people that shaped what India and like what that whole region is like now. But at the time they, you know, as an individual, you just feel like, well, I'm just doing what I want or doing what I need to do to make a living or to keep my family safe or because I just thought like, why not, right? Like there are all kinds of reasons why people do things and we can't ever know like how it all fits in. Um, so that was, again, like what I really enjoyed in writing the book is, is sort of taking some of those individual stories and there are just so many of them that are so remarkable and, and trying to kind of place them in that larger context. Yeah, I was thinking. Um, I know it's a, it's a it's at this point a overused Steve Jobs quote of "You can't connect the dots looking forward; you can only do it looking back." And it, it makes me think of that. You you don't know um, how important the arc that you're in or the social context mm -hmm. you can enter so much you can control. But um, it, it's it's also really interesting. And 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 for me, as I as I read this wonderful book, it's like once I started seeing the entrepreneurial themes, I think clearly it's a bias I couldn't stop. Um, stop seeing them everywhere. Um, I, I'd love one portion of it, which was so interesting, even the opening of the nursing school mm -hmm. um, in some way was a, a pivot, right? From the original hospital and they really did it to mm -hmm. fill a need. I'd love for you to, to maybe just talk a little bit about that sort of, um, that moment for the order. Yeah, again, that is absolutely like, you know, what they, like they did not go there imagining, oh, and we'll start a nursing school. Like they, you know, they, they had never really done that. You know, it's like they're, they, they definitely had um, women in the order who were nurses, but you know, they would go to other universities like other places to be trained for nursing or, you know, learn in the, in the hospitals that the, uh, that the order ran. But like, this was something completely new and it was totally just based on the uh, the need because they're just were, I mean, there were, so, there were, I think I, I have this statistic, statistic in the book. Um, there were only some, you know, perhaps like 7,000 nurses in 1945 in all of India, like a country of like 200 million people wow. at that time. Um, so, I mean, there were huge, like, the need was so great. Like there was just no way for them to run a hospital um, by relying on, you know, the, like the number of nurses that would otherwise be trained in India at that time. Um, it's also interesting that they, they were insistent on doing that because they were not interested in, you know, just running a hospital that was like, well, you know, this is all we've got you know, well, these are like, this is a poor place, a, you know, a poor country. So we'll just sort of do the best with what, we, you know, with what we've got, right? Like they, they really went in with this commitment and belief that like it was like they wanted to deliver the best possible standard of care, right? To everybody, mm -hmm. just as they did in their hospitals in the United States. And to do that, you need nurses and you need well-trained nurses. So they said, well, if we don't have them, I guess we'll just have to 
train them ourselves. So that's what they did. Um, so that was kind of, again, it was just, they're just kind of moving forward, like not realizing that, that um, <laughs> like, well, this is what we need to do. So we'll just do it. And I think in some ways, um, the nursing school, I mean, not so much the school itself, but that I, you know, that process of like training all these young Indian women, you know, women from the South initially, but like now many of the nurses who are trained through this, uh, this order come from uh, indigenous communities in central India. Um, like in a way that is perhaps like the most powerful and unique legacy of what they've done because I mean, now there are, of course, like many other hospitals in India, like even in that town, there are other hospitals, but there aren't very many, you know, places where women from villages can go and like get this incredibly valuable skill, be trained, live on their own, become fa financially independent. Um, and, you know, again, like this is an institution that's now run entirely by women in India, you know, how many institutions and in, how many other institutions in India are there like that? Like very, very few. So again, just like setting that example, you know, um, the, their presence itself is a, an incredibly powerful thing. Yeah, and, and um, my question to you is, do you think it was something unique about them as individuals or was it the institution they came from? And in some ways, this is like a such a meta age old question, even of when you want to create these in the future, right? Is, mm -hmm. it, um, is it nurture and find determined individuals and get out of their way? Or, you know, the organization and its culture automatically breeds this kind of frontier spirit? Mm -hmm. You know, I guess, of course, it's, it's always a little bit of both. Um, but I, I do feel that there's something it, like, I think that commitment again, we, that we talked about at the beginning to, you know, to, to just sort of embrace the challenges, like just do whatever needs to be done. Uh, you don't necessarily, I mean, of course that a attracts people who, you know, have that sense of adventure, who want to try new things. But I think it's it's more than that. I think that um, even people who, you know, might might not define themselves in that way, um, in that situation, and given the opportunity, can do amazing things. You know, um, so I think that's that's a a big lesson. And again, I feel like many of us have seen that during the pandemic. You know, it's just a, I mean that is a crisis, and you sort of you sort of see, oh, some of the people who really rose to the challenge are may not have been the people that you expected, right? And mm -hmm. I think this kind of extreme situation, ex you know, uh, frontier, like extremely challenging situations, like they can often bring out the best in people. And, um, and I think that, you know, the... The women of the order saw that, uh, you know, the young women who came there again, like they had a, to train as nurses, like they really did. Um, uh, they had a similar situation of kind of coming to a place, you know, really not knowing what they were getting into and yet kind of rising to the challenge. Okay, Anna, did you have a question? I didn't see that. Yes, I know, Anna, you were saying uh, her question was, what is the frontier situation for women today I had, the, I had the same question uh and Jyothi would love mm. would love your thoughts but also please Irene Michelle and, and Saguna please feel free to jump in as well mm -hmm. uh a frontier situation just like in in general yeah I mean wow there are, there are so many um I mean frankly I mean in my own field for sure um even you know uh, at the upper levels of journalism, again, like there are very few women, very few women of color. Um, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I've discovered in the process of writing a book that um, the field, you know, writing about history, writing nonfiction, again, 
not female driven. Very, very <laughs> few women authors and, you know, not very many uh, women as subjects. Again, mm -hmm. um, I think partly because of, you know, who is in the historical record, who is writing about the things that they do and who shares that, mm -hmm. right? Like, I think there are so many um, amazing stories out there that we're not aware of because, you know, either because writers, scholars haven't sought them out for various reasons or because, you know, they don't necessarily appear in the historical record. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, there, there are so many, I mean, for sure, I think in, uh, um, I mean, this is not a field that I know well, but I think, you know, in the humanities, there are many more women, but I'm still sort of stunned to see, um, you know, in engineering and math and science, like how overwhelmingly male dominated those fields are. Um, and, you know, it's like, and it's like, like what, what is it exactly that makes, um, makes that change? And I'm, I'm not totally sure. I do feel like there is something about building new institutions, you know, where you're not mm. bound by like, okay, well, you know, these old prestigious established institutions like are not making room, like how much effort can you make to sort of like, create just a tiny bit of space, right? Mm -hmm. But like, if you make your own institutions without that legacy, without the baggage, like that can be a, a very powerful thing. And that, and talk about the eternal frontier, that is the frontier. You get mm -hmm. to, you get to, yeah, throw away social structures and norms. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, one of the other fascinating things that we were talking about, or one of my observations from this book too, was um, when, uh, whether it's for missionaries or for startups, it's it's clear that, I mean, what drove this, these the amazing women and, and people in this book are mission and faith. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that sort of made me, right, link it to um, whether it is, you know, creating a school um, for the, the, you know, the, the, the poorest of people in a place you've never been, or whether it's, you know, creating new products or services, if you don't have faith helps you overcome mm -hmm. insurmountable obstacles. And I know you had some really interesting thoughts on even thinking about faith-driven groups and institutions. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd argue almost every you know company or whatever has to be faith-driven today in order to mission-driven, faith-driven to make something, but would love to, would love to riff on that. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I, I mean, clearly like what they were doing at its core was you know, driven by belief, by faith, you know, literally like mission driven, right? Like we hear that phrase a lot in companies and in institutions. I mean, this is like literally a mission. So, but I think what, what actually keeps it going beyond just that initial like, oh, look, here we are, we started a mission. Like, look how, look how, look how great we are for just like being here. Um, the thing that has allowed that mission and that institution to endure, I mean, it's still there today. And it um, is, I think, a willingness to respond. I mean, you know, all along the way, and I, I've described this in many instances in the book, where people within the community, people from outside would challenge them, you know, and challenge some of their ways of doing things, some of their um, some of their beliefs, some of like, well, why do you do things in this way? Like, why, like, why can't we um, change this? Like, like, why are all these rules here? And that created a lot of conflict. And, you know, I think the institutions that survive and endure over time are the ones that can, are able to kind of absorb that challenge and respond to it and are willing to change. You know, it's like, how do you change and adapt to circumstances, change and adapt to different kinds of people um, and still somehow stay true to like, what is actually core to the mission? And, mm -hmm. and if it isn't, can you simply just let go of it? And I think that's where people really, um, uh, I think that's where you have problems, like either where you're not willing to listen to criticism, not willing to kind of absorb and respond to it or 
you know, people get so attached to like, well, this is how we've always done things. And this is our, this is our tradition that, you know, you're, you're not willing to, to change. Um, I mean, even the hospital itself, I, I sort of describe at the end, it's still there, but it has, um, uh, you know, it has kind of shifted and changed over time because they've seen that there are other hospitals, like we're not, we didn't come here to just like maintain this big building and the machines in it. Like that's not, mm -hmm. that's not the purpose of it. The purpose is to serve the community and, you know, provide healthcare. And so if there is a better way to do that, that perhaps doesn't even, I mean, many, so many times over the years, people like, the women in this world have told me like, you know, yeah, it was an amazing thing to build, build this hospital, but maybe we don't need the hospital. Like maybe we can do our work just, you know, by going out into the villages, like by, you know, mm. with smaller clinics, like they're like, they don't, they are not so attached to the things that might see that you might assume that they are. Mm. That, that's really incredible. There's one more thing I want to touch on. And then I know we have a fantastic group of women. So I wanted to open up, open it up to questions. Um, there's a very interesting angle on, you know, sort of, again, the value of, of people and a small group of people banding together community in creating hard, difficult things, right? When you think about outsiders, there's such a, there's such a view of like rugged individualists trying to make it in the world. But in this particular story, and in so many things, it's small groups that come together and make the impossible happen. You have, you have, you have great examples in the, in, in the book, even of Father Batson, who you know, who, who you know, uh, secured the land versus um, mm -hmm. you know the the group of women who helped and endured it, and I'd love to just maybe hear a little bit about that contrast and that story from you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was really, um, in some ways, I, I felt like it was such a classic contrast between the sort of you know the um, the traditional idea of this missionary as sort of like one person going out into the wilderness and you know, and doing things just with like with the force of will. Um, but, you know, that only went so far, you know, he was a little bit, um, you know, he sort of went rogue in a way, which was like, okay, that was amazing in some ways, but he wasn't actually able to deliver on all these things that he had promised, right? Um, so in order to actually, um, do all these things like really like the best thing he did was to bring in this group of women and also to kind of give that work over to them um, mm -hmm. and it was so interesting both that you know the like there there's a sort of subtext in some of the early letters where they're you know Batson was around in the first few months but like the you know the the nuns in the order they really like wanted to to sort of like draw some boundaries and say like, okay, you know, we're gonna do our thing now and like trying not to, you know, be appreciative but not rely on him too much. Um, and then, and also I think it's probably not a coincidence that his superiors um, like never, never assigned him to that mission again, like after that first year, you know, it's like he was considered sort of like, okay, he must've had an amazing vision and, uh, you know, did a lot in difficult circumstances, but he was not the person that you needed to actually carry the cell. Yeah, it was like very, very, uh, very applicable. I was, I'm, I'm trying to think of, it's so apt because I think mm -hmm. even as you think about startups and corporate transitions, sometimes people, right, it's, it's um, people who have the vision for things may not necessarily have the wherewithal to bring it to life and then sustain mm -hmm. it beyond. Um, but I, I, I will stop um, seeing just the uh, my, my startup lessons in the book. I, I wanted to open it up and, and sort of, again, part of a salon is having a, a conversation about this. So um, please, any, any, any questions? Uh, just a curious question that, I mean, this group of women, they came into India at a very different timeline, as you mentioned. So while navigating multiple levels of complexities, you know, structural, societal, um, and even adapting to the local culture, uh, did you find any uh, stage during the journey where they were thinking of giving up or they really stuck? to their, uh, you know, calling or you know, the mm. whole purpose. So 
and just wanted to uh, see if you found uh, in, in your research or was it faith that kind of held them together to overcome mm -hmm. all the challenges? You know, I don't know that it was, I mean, I'm sure that that helped, but I have to say they don't, they don't really talk about that as much as you might think in their letters or like when they're describing like what gets them through or what's, what's motivating them. I mean, of course, I'm sure that's, that's present, but I will tell you the things they definitely talk about. One is they were very conscious of the idea that, um, you know, their supporters back in the United States, you know, the order and donors had given a lot of money for them to start this mission. And so they really, like on some level, they felt like, okay, we have to kind of make good on like what, like this, I mean, you could call it an investment or, you know, their donations, like, like that people are expecting us to start a hospital. So we need to start a hospital and, you know, we need to sort of do what we came here to do. Um, so that was definitely a big part of it. Um, the other thing is like, what, what kept them going? Um, I mean, I think in some ways it was just like the work itself, you know, again, I think our conception of like what motivates religious women, it's not, it's actually like not purely religion because every single um, uh, non every, you know, everyone who was involved in this whole project, they were all like highly, highly trained women. You know, they were nurses, operating room nurses, pharmacists, you know, some multiple things, surgeons, um, uh, they had so many skills and they took those, they took their own training, like what they were there to do. They took it so seriously. They were like, well, you know, if like, if, if they were going to start a pharmacy, like it had to be like exactly the way it was supposed to be. Like they had such a commitment to, um, to that work, you know, and they wanted to actually, they wanted to see it through. They wanted to see like, well, what can we do? You know, it's like when you know you have these skills and you know that like they're needed in a place, right? Um, it's, it's honestly, it's just that incredible satisfaction of seeing um, your work actually like have an effect. Um, and I think that's something that I've seen in this order, like um, just really like all through the years, like they take their own work incredibly seriously. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's amazing uh, just to read about them. And I was thinking maybe <clears throat> they uh, were pivotal in, you know, creating a lot of, as you said, there were 7,000 nurses, but today mm -hmm. when you look at the larger context, a lot of the nurses actually come from India. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, percentage of nurses across different countries where who are Indian. So I was just thinking, you know, probably what they did might have uh, the impact that we see today. Yeah, I think so. I think so. And again, it's sort of like setting that example for Indian women that, you know, like this is this is a profession that you can have and not just that you can have as an individual, but that there's a whole community around it, you know, like there are these other women who will support you and, you know, be a network for you. I mean, that was definitely the case with my mother. I mean, some of her closest friends, even today, I mean, she's retired now, but are her classmates that she met when she was a teenager in the school. And they, wow. you know, they studied together, they finished nursing together. They, you know, they were, again, like in the late 60s and early 70s, living in India as young single women in dormitories, like in, in a big city uh, by themselves. And like, it was, again, like the other nurses, like their, their peers who supported them. And then same thing, like, you know, many of them got married, came to the United States, navigating yet another new world. It was that same network that kind of got them through that. It's amazing. 
you know, and so, so um, <laughs> it's so interesting how, like, when you think a lot of, like, they were so conscious about all of, uh, wait, can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. yes we can. Please go ahead. Um, yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Um, so I was just thinking, like, it's so interesting that like you give women a lot of capital and they're so conscious and they're just so responsible and there's all this impact. And, you know, years later, you see all the changes that, that have happened, um, even though we've seen so many examples over time. And when, when you trust not to make this like a gender debate, but I just like <laughs> I, I love how women can just be amazing. Um, but I, I was wondering, I mean, you, you mentioned how, like, you know, they're not married to the idea of the institution as much as going out to villages even now and, and really training women. And, and mm -hmm. I wonder, like, I feel like that could be so impactful as well, but I wonder how things have changed even over time and, and what similarities there are in terms of challenges for women in rural areas right now, you know, like, would that be maybe how the legacy continues? Is this sort of like a almost mm -hmm. like a decentralized version of carrying the impact and the legacy forward. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm like, mm -hmm. my brain just works in like web food <laughs> technology these days, all... but like, I, <laughs> so excuse me for that. But like, I, that, was, that was the easiest way that I could like articulate it. But um, do, do you feel like that would be impactful and that would really even cross borders maybe? Because there's, there's so much of this that I feel like could maybe even help all across like South Asia and other countries like Pakistan or Bangladesh and mm -hmm. Sri Lanka as well, mm -hmm. right? And I just wonder how, how that could work or if they thought about that. Oh yeah, in fact, I mean, this order, like the, the mission that I described in Bihar, like that was their first mission, but they have since then, um, like they've gone to many other parts of, of India. Of course, they, you know, they sort of started in different parts of Bihar and, um, I think this was the only really like big full service hospital that they started, but then, yeah, they, they sort of moved into much more remote areas, you know, in tribal areas with, with sort of small clinics and some places, schools, again, kind of going to places where they felt like they could make an impact, sort of seeing like, well, what's the thing that people really need that they don't have, right? And what can we provide? They would do that. Um, so they've gone to different parts of Bihar. They have a mission in Nepal, they have missions in, in parts of South India, and not only in South Asia, like they have a mission in Botswana, they have a mission in Belize. Um, they, I mean, they really, it's like they, they're they not kind of limited, again, by this idea that, well, we, we started this great hospital, therefore we have to do hospitals. You know, it's that's not it at all. It's, um, it's much more that sense of just being willing to go and, and, you know, in some cases, of course it is shaped by like, well, who are the individuals who are in our group? Like, what are the skills that we have that people need? Um, what are the things that we can develop? And then, you know, they're, they're so incredibly adaptable. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like there's not any parallels to like groups that are sort of, that have this and embody this frontier spirit? right now in India and I like I've been thinking about this just in the region just locally who are having this impact and I you know I'm so curious to see over the next 10 20 30 40 years like mm -hmm. who will sort of become that almost mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah I think there I think there are um again this is not um I haven't cited a lot of other groups like this but definitely I think the um the models of you know whether it's like social change or healthcare or education, um, the models that tend to survive that, you know, that endure over time and like really make a difference for people are the ones that both, um, I mean, they're, you know, you need a strong institution. So I, I don't want to discount the idea of institutions, right? Like you do need, um, you need something that's, you know, where, where there's a, some kind of center, like some kind of center of purpose, I suppose. Um, but also that willingness to change, I think a, a, a willingness to sort of bring the thing to where it's actually needed is really important, right? So you've seen that with, um, I mean, the example that comes to mind recently, I, I met um, uh, an outfit out of, it's actually a Canadian group that does sort of like 
first response to natural disasters in different parts of the world. And they were asked, you know, because like they work with a lot of um, doctors and other healthcare workers in Canada to, um, well, particularly in, uh, from, from Southern India. And so they wanted, like these people in Canada wanted to help in India during COVID but this group wanted to be really thoughtful about it. They're like, well, we don't want to just sort of like parachute in and like dump a bunch of supplies. You know, it might make you feel good, but like that's not necessarily what's what's going to work, what's, you know, what's needed or what's sustainable. So they really kind of um, took some time to figure out like, well, the thing that we could do that would make an impact, not just in this crisis, but down the line is, they ended up um, bringing uh, like uh, pulse oximeters and you know sort of oxygen supplies that could be brought to remote like remote areas like away from hospitals that would allow people to be to like care care for COVID patients at home. Um, so that they didn't end up in hospitals, right? And that was all equipment that could be used in the future, like even after COVID, right? You're not just sort of like dumping a bunch of supplies that, you know, then end up in the trash. Um, but also it sort of, it was responsive to like, what is the thing that's already there? I mean, there are hospitals, like there are, like there were, you know, um, trained people, but like, you know, what was the thing that would, um, would actually make a difference. And I think that's where it's really key. And often that it is about either specific kinds of technology or specific kinds of training, right? And training in particular is like, it's hard to do, it's hard to do it well. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of, you know, to be an educator, you know, whether it's in technology, in medicine, in basic, you know, reading, writing, math, like that itself is, you know, is a really difficult skill. And I think one that uh, many people don't take seriously. I mean, just the skill of being an educator, right? And so I think that's, I think that's a, a big missing piece of it. So, you know, to answer a question, like, what is the thing that I think, like the model, I think, again, like that willingness to say, like, you know, a hospital is not just equipment or medicine, it's the skill, right? And that is what they really, really invested in. It's so interesting, I, I recently came back uh, from India, I mean, literally two days ago, and this was my first trip. Um, and I, I was so blessed to uh, to kind of represent the non-Indian uh, uh, winners of Mercatus Center's uh, Emergent Ventures. Um, but this was the India branch and, and I, I was just, you know, in this, sea of 16 year old Indian geniuses, hundreds of them in this hotel uh, who had these really weird problems. Like we can't receive the funding because we're 15, <laughs> you know? But they had already invented a uh, plastic and have a company. And also they are also already like neuroscience PhD candidates. It was like really surreal. And I was like, what did I do today? <laughs> you know? like, like, so good way to feel really uh, kind of superfluous in the world. Um, but what really struck me was how many of them work on education or healthcare. Uh, I, I, and then I hosted a big interinsect dinner in Bangalore. Uh, a couple of EV people came, but it was mostly just interinsect community and hosts who are based in Bangalore. And we were just at this long table and just having food. It was, it was lovely. And then I was listening in on the conversations, everybody making friends already, you know. Um, it's a different generations, different levels of religiosity, married, unmarried, like it was a very diverse group uh, of, of kind of Bangalore residents. And, and I, I started picking up this theme and, and I was like, okay, everybody, shh, hands up who, who is working on solutions in education. I don't know, eight people raised their hands. Okay, hands up who's working on solutions in healthcare. Six people raised their hands. And it seems to be, you know, what I got from your book and this whole idea is, that there is something happened after the Second World War around the world in the US, in the UK, NHS, you know, in, in your story, where we rethought healthcare and access and training after the Second World War because we had just gone through 
of global trauma that claim the lives of tens of millions of people similarly to COVID. And then we learned. And we were like, okay, so it's scale and skill and access, and we can actually move people around the map to match needs. Mm -hmm. And you have the US with its own geographical you know, challenges. It's different in India. Indian geography has a lot of challenges and you have to deal with it, right? Um, and you just can't, it's not flat. Yeah, it's not flat and it's not homogeneous. And, but how much this tradition now lives on in the young researcher and entrepreneur community is just astounding to me. Mm -hmm. I, I, do, you, do you see the continuity or do you, do you see that this recent entrepreneurial you know, revival maybe is new? Because I do feel that there is something here, post-war partition, mm -hmm. and this mm -hmm. process, I know this is yeah. a weird, weird question, but I trust your I trust your journalistic experience too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I think at that time there was a sense that you know they were building an institution at the same time that like India was building a lot of institutions, right? Like the um, the big hospitals, Ames, like the IITs, like the I mean, it, like if you think about it, they were all built in that time, right? In um, in the 1950s and, and 1960s. I mean, in fact, like there's one scene in the book where, um, you know, the nuns have been working there for a few years and it's like, oh, the, you know, the, the United Nations and Ford Foundation, like they, they sort of show up for the first time, like, oh yeah, I think like they, they, those groups also like had just arrived in India thinking like, maybe we'll do some, some things in healthcare and education as well. And they're like, sure, you know, like, why not, right? Like this was, it was all new. It was all of this period of, of building. Um, and I, I really would like to think that um, something like that would be possible now as well. You know, I guess the, the thing that troubles me though is, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I don't, I wouldn't, <laughs> I don't think any country or any group of people, you know, deserves to go through like that the trauma of uh, partition or World War II. You know, I mean, that it's like so much was just destroyed. I mean, so many people, but that there was a sense of like, well, everything. You know, they just had to start from scratch in so many different ways, right? Um, now. The problem I think now is that like we have gone through this trauma, but I, I feel like there's much more a sense of like, well, we have institutions, but why haven't they, why haven't they responded? You know, it's like we have these sort of crumbling institutions as opposed to like a vacuum where like you have to build something in a vacuum, right? It's not that there weren't institutions, it's that so many of them failed. And I think that's a, a difficult position to be in. Um, so, I mean, I, I hope the response perhaps is like to renew those existing institutions. Like you shouldn't have to like, you know, rebuild the CDC, like rebuild like <laughs> all those public hospitals, you know, in India and other places that like didn't quite, you know, rise to the challenge. Like you, you hope that there's a, a way to renew them, right? Um, the other thing that I think perhaps we need more of is, you know, I, I don't know if we saw it enough during COVID, but just, you know, I, I, and I can't emphasize this enough, like this idea that like nurses in World War II and even afterward, they were heroes, you know, it's like, that was just like such an, like an adventurous, like a thing that you could do, you know, I don't know that we, we don't envision care work or healthcare work or the work of educators in that same way. You know, like I, I feel like there's been a real devaluing of it. And I wish I could say that like COVID had changed that, but I, I don't think it completely has. And I think, again, it's like, you know, why do we invest in certain things? Like how are institutions built? I think some of it is just 
how how are these professions and these groups of people perceived you know and again it's like part of what I was trying to do in this book is like how do we think of these women? Like, how, like when you see again, like you know, you you all have mentioned, um, you know, you see in hospitals in the United States and you know many other parts of the world, women from India, from the Philippines, from Nigeria, from different places. Like, how do we think of those women? Like, what do we know about their stories or mm-hmm. what they've gone through to get to that point? Right. So. That's again, like part of what I wanted to do here is like really sort of challenge that that narrative of what it means to be a care worker. Um, um, riffing on one of the things you're saying is, um, would I think what you're also saying is, would they have the kind of not just status, but you know, celebration and recognition um, for doing these these really tough caregiving mm-hmm. type of roles versus. I'm going to give you a facetious example of like, I don't know, eye banking, right? It's like, there are these, these arbitrary mm-hmm. professions and, and markers that have, you know, sort of higher status and, you know, sort of uh, lauded and presented in different ways. And maybe, maybe that's, that's what you're saying, right? It's mm-hmm. these mm-hmm. stories are part of bringing them to light and, and um, almost showing how difficult they were. And that's they were right. very, it's not just caregiving and, oh, I care for a single person, but systemically you're, you're caring for there's organizations there's institution there's strategic complexity that's beyond a child is crying i pick them up or something you know mm-hmm. something very dumb mm-hmm. down like that yeah the exactly and the skill that's involved in in all of these professions i think um i think many of us don't fully appreciate um i wanted to see if there's any other questions if not i had one question and i had one quote from your book, which is my, there are many amazing, (laughs) beautiful writing, but I had one sentence and maybe I can start with that, that, that that quote and then ask you the question. Um, uh, so the quote that really stood out with me and I was like, Oh, this is, this is like worthy of a quote pull out. And like, where do I put it (laughs) in my room? Um, uh, this I'm going to, I'm just going to read the quote. Um, Mary was, this is referring to always said that of the three vows, poverty, chastity, and obedience, the last one was the hardest. It was convenient not to have money or things and temptations faded over time, but she found it hard to have her life determined by other people. For women like her, obedience was difficult. And I was like, (laughs) I was thinking of like, well-behaved women rarely make history. And for me, that was so many of the pioneering women, so many entrepreneurs. I mean, this is, this is a, I thought it was a, anyway, it was a beautifully written quote. Um, with that, my question to you is going to be, um, as your your kids, I think you mentioned daughters, as your daughters mm-hmm. read this book, what do you want them to take away? Mm-hmm. Well, that's a, that's a great question. So they have read parts of it. And, you know, honestly, like my, my main goal, when, at one point, they my older one said, well, it's not boring. So I thought like, okay, that's a win. You know, <laughs> she's like 16. So, you know, the, the bar is very high. Um, so I think, again, I, I think what I wanted, what I wanted them to take away from this, because it, you know, this is a story about uh, their grandmother, you know, the, I mean, they're, they're both, um, they both were born in the United States. So um, their connection to, to India, to South Asia is, is different from mine, but in some ways also like um, more expansive. I mean, they, you know, they've had a chance to travel uh, all over the world. Like they don't, they don't have the same kind of like fixed categories about what it means to be American or, what it means to be Indian or from other parts of South Asia or what it means to be a woman, like all of those things. So I think that's, that's a wonderful thing. But again, what I, what I wanted to do, I think for them was to answer some of the questions that, um, that I had growing up, you know, for them. So I can say like, well, how did this all happen? Like, where do we fit into this larger story? Um, but I think also, um, again, going back to the, the history part of it, um, you know, they're big fans of uh, Miss Marvel. And I, 
I know there, I don't know if any of you guys have watched this show, but um, apparently like the, the Netflix version of it had this whole thing about like when the character is like family backstory, you know, goes back to partition. And so many of the people watching it, like, oh, like I never, I never knew all these things that had happened, um, which I think is, uh, I, you know, and I, I think it's, it's great, like that, that um, a show like that is, you know, getting people interested in this history. But I think what I wanted to, again, sort of show is that history isn't just in these, um, you know, people who happen to witness like big dramatic events. It's like, it's also the stories of, of people, of women who on some level, like they're just living their lives, you know, they're mm -hmm. just sort of, you know, well, I was trained as a nurse, I'm trained as a surgeon. I had a chance to do, like, they're just kind of doing the things that they feel they're meant to do. And yet in their own way, they're also shaping history. So I think that's what I want them to understand also that whatever they end up doing in their lives, you know, they will also shape history in some way. We just don't know what, what history that is yet. That's beautiful. Well, that's such an incredible hide to, to leave on. I know uh, <laughs> I'm to be mindful of time and I'm, I'm sure it's dinner time in the yeah. East Coast. Um, thank you so much uh, for one, not only your, your, your beautiful worlds, but also this fantastic salon. It was such mm -hmm. an absolute pleasure to talk to you today. Yeah, you guys had amazing questions. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate the, the close reading and the excellent questions. And I would just, you know, thank you for reading. And I, I, I would really encourage you all to, you know, if there are other groups of people, women or otherwise, who you think might respond to, you know, some of the ideas in this book, please share. And um, I really like, that's kind of why I wrote this, I think to, um, you know, I, I want people to sort of see themselves in some of these stories. And it's, it's wonderful that, um, that you all were able to do that. So thank you. Thank you so much. I learned so much from you in this brief period of knowing about the book and, and preparing for the salon. Just so many feels. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye.